and our subject this morning is the rules for church expansion and we shall be looking time permitting at this single chapter chapter 6 of the book of Acts but I shall give you a number of headings which have to do really with the Church of Jesus Christ and its expansion in those days and we'll seek to follow the narrative of history at the same time. Now this first heading will be quite simply the uh, principle of church government, that is the basic principle, the first principle of church government. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, well it's been estimated that there were now about 20 to 25,000 at least believers in Jerusalem, converts under the glorious sound of the gospel. Some put the figure much higher, 35 to 40,000, but at least 20 to 25,000. And with so many people and so many needs, remember there were some who'd been thrown out of their homes, because of the great hostility of many of the Jews toward them. There were others who were very poor, and so there was a daily ministration, distribution. We've read all about the community of goods and the people who sold up their additional homes and land. At least I assume it was their additional properties uh, and land and so on, in order to distribute to the needy. And in the distribution, which must have been a mammoth undertaking among so many, a problem had arisen, and we read about it here. There arose a murmuring, a whispering of the Grecians. Now, they were not Greeks, as you probably know. They were what we call Hellenists. They were people who, uh, perhaps... Uh, Israelites who had been dispersed and way, way back in their history at the time of the return of Israelites from captivity in the Babylonian Empire, well, the vast majority of Israelites had not returned. But there was always a trickle down the centuries of people who'd gone back to Jerusalem. But they spoke Greek. They spoke the language of the Greek Empire which came along and they were uh, very much conformed to uh, Greek ways and culture and really they were foreigners in Jerusalem. Had their own language, their own culture, but they were very fervent Hebrews, Jews as well. But they obviously kept themselves to a large extent aside from the nationals, that is, uh, the, those who spoke Aramaic and used Hebrew, the Hebrew scriptures and Hebrew in their worship. So there were at least two big cultural streams among the Jews. And it's implied in this passage that the Greek-speaking Jews had their own assemblies, their own congregations. But now they were converted and they were in the one church of Jesus Christ. But the apostles couldn't cope with the burden, especially the compassionate ministry, and organizing the distribution of relief and so on and so there was murmuring. It's very interesting that the apostles didn't primarily rebuke the murmuring though the murmuring was a shame that it should have happened in the church and this should have led to any bitterness or discontent but they looked for the cause of it. Yes, that's an old Puritan saying. Uh, it's an old saying that was used in, as advice to married couples. Always look for the truth in a complaint. And that's good advice to us all. The complaint may be made in an unreasonable way, but always look for the truth at the bottom of it and respond to it. And it's certainly what the apostles did here because we read nothing of any rebuke, only of their, obviously through prayer, seeking to put the matter right. There was a valid difficulty, because the widows of the Grecians, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, who turn out to be every bit as 
bigoted and in a Jewish way as the Hebrew speaking Jews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution or ministration. Verse 2, uh, we're really going to be talking for a moment about the first rule of church government. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not reason. The Greek says something like it is not pleasing. Pleasing to God, pleasing to you, it is not reason or pleasing that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. They don't disdain the serving of tables. Of course their task would have been the organizing of all this, not literally the serving of tables. It's a kind of figure of speech, or that's the way uh, it's used. But nevertheless, what they say is so important. With 20 to 25,000 people at least, and such opportunity in the city, a great door of opportunity had opened and the people were listening and just for the moment the persecution which had already started was in abeyance and probably some years elapsed between chapter 5 and chapter 6 here uh, maybe not too long but it rather seems from the narrative that time had passed and yet they'd been free to preach the gospel and more and more people were being converted. They had as much as they could cope with and so they propose seven men of honest report. Brethren, look ye out among you, seven men, oh we love to debate almost the lesser things and the amount of debate on why seven you wouldn't believe. But I don't think anybody really knows why seven. It is, of course, the ideal, the perfect number in the scriptures. But suggestions range from the fact that the congregation at the church at Jerusalem now met in seven congregations, so they each needed an almoner or somebody to take care and to organize the daily distribution to those in dire need. But that's only a possibility. There certainly would have been a multiplicity of gatherings. How could you get 20, 25,000 people at least in any one place? So there would have been numerous gatherings in that vast church. Well, nevertheless, look out, seven people of honest report. And here is the first and the basic principle of church government which comes out here which isn't obeyed as it should be today and I turn to Matthew chapter 20 we were looking at this in a Bible study not very long ago and I read from verse 25 Jesus called them unto him this is exclusive instruction just to the disciples and said ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them they're very autocratic they have lordship and authority and they exercise it and they that are great exercise authority upon them in other words says the Lord to the disciples among the Gentiles government is hierarchical and it is to this day in the world and you get a supreme prime minister or president or whatever and then those under them a government, a cabinet perhaps, and those under them. Then a whole pyramid of bureaucracy and the authority goes down. Verse 26 of Matthew 20, But it shall not be so among you. There should never be a pope and archbishops and bishops such as we have in the Roman Catholic Church. We're not surprised to find it in the Roman Catholic Church because it lost all doctrinal soundness somewhere between the 4th and the 6th centuries AD. It shall not be so among you. Unfortunately, we have it in our national church, the Church of England and other Episcopal Anglican churches, that the time of the Reformation became reformed in respect of doctrine, but not sadly in respect of church government. So it was a church, even in its best time, after the Reformation, that was reformed in that it started to preach the gospel 
and it's so few do today, alas, in the national church, very few. However, and it had turned to correct doctrine at that time, reflected in its 39 articles, but it never changed matters with regard to church government. And it left pretty well, not entirely, but pretty well the Catholic system in place in its own ranks. But it shall not be so among you, said the Lord. There must never be hierarchical government in the church of Jesus Christ. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And the passage goes on. And that is the first principle and rule of church government. No hierarchical system. And you see here how the apostles are so careful to put that into, the effect, into effect. They'd been in the seminary of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And they kept that principle. So instead of appointing people themselves, we are the apostles. Well, they were very special people in the foundation stage of the church. And some were given words, inspired words, which would be preserved in the scripture. And all of them approved the canon of scripture as it developed. But they didn't appoint underlings to channel their authority through them. They didn't for a moment suggest that they would personally select and appoint people who would take up this work. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you. There would be people known in the, to the believers, approved by them, obviously with honest reputations, full of the Holy Ghost. We could discuss that at length. And wisdom, a particular mark of the equipping of the Holy Spirit, in their case, would be that they had wisdom, care, they, they could tell who had need and who didn't. They would be wise and fair in every way whom we may appoint over this business. The apostles then would set them aside. But they wouldn't. There would be government by choice. They wouldn't themselves select them. They may have proposed, we're not given the exact details of how they went about this, for detail, we look not in Acts 6, because it's silent about the machinery, the details, but we look at the pastoral epistles. We look at the rules, which were laid down by God through the inspired Apostle Paul. But here we note that the great fundamental principle is put into effect and complied with. No hierarchy. Servants is the word. In fact, look at it here in verse 2 at the end of the verse. It is not pleasing or reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. That's actually the, the, the deacon word, the Greek word from which deacon comes. So although they're not called deacons, the deacon word is nestling there in the text. Service is the notion of the apostles. But in verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that brings me to a second heading, and it is this. The two only fundamentals of ministry. Now in these days, we want to know how the church should be expanded. And there are endless books on church growth. And there are many ideas and innovations and proposals. Never have there been so many methods proposed for enlarging churches of Christ. All sorts of things that have never been done before or that have emerged only in the last 50 years or so. It's the age of innovation. But did you know that the scripture says... In effect, no innovation. No human innovation. There are two things you do to win souls. There are two things that lie at the foundation of everything that the Church of Jesus Christ does, that any individual congregation does. Just two things, and they're here, and they're mentioned in this very verse by the Apostle. 
and they come of course from the seminary of Jesus Christ the lessons he taught the apostles exclusively so here it is the uh, we come down to verse 4 we will give ourselves continually exclusively to two things prayer and the ministry of the word just a minute examine the text what does it say about choirs what does it say about drama what does it say about uh, people bringing their own artwork and having worship stations in the church and traveling round from one exhibition for an to another what does it say about all the gimmicks and the notions and the ideas that have been peddled in recent years many new today what does it say about the authors probably they mean well but they, they write books and on the dust jacket it says here is a book that will help you to do church differently do church differently well that's exactly what the book is about human innovation replacing the agenda of the word of God we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word the primacy of preaching recovered at the Reformation held dear by the churches of Jesus Christ down the centuries until the age of arrogance oh yes we're the most educated generation ever that's true people are much more highly educated much better trained know many many more things we can't denigrate that but it has gone to our heads as a society it's made us the most arrogant and conceited generation at the drop of a hat we rewrite the word of God we turn out God's methods and substitute our own and this is what Bible believing churches are often doing everywhere well here's the principle of the word of God and we should appreciate this dear friends and always preserve our church to these things and try to persuade others to do so this is real church expansion if God is going to bless in that way oh you say I know people and their church majors on drama and this and that and, and, and bands and music and the latest a Christianized rock and so on and they get lots of people yes but we're talking about real church growth people who are really converted they've come under conviction of sin they've repented before God they've laid their lives at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ they've been truly born again and transformed so that they've left the world and they live for Christ and serve him you don't get much of that in churches that are expanded by alternative methods to those that are revealed in the scriptures there's a lot of sham there's a lot of phony there's a lot which is shallow we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word so the ministry of the word the preaching of the gospel the preaching of the word of God the persuasion of people the appealing to them we could speak about this at great length and alongside that goes reliance on the Holy Spirit of God that's where the prayer comes in the Apostles prayed individually they prayed as much as they preached they never preached they never entered a house and taught the occupants without praying earnestly privately to God for effect and for salvation they registered before God their complete and utter dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit every day of their lives they prayed they were men of prayer they led in prayer they led the congregations in earnest prayer they encouraged everybody to pray preaching cannot be blessed without prayer the twin foundations preaching and prayer and by preaching I would include witness too, personal witness all proclamation all speaking for Jesus Christ the twin foundations preaching and prayer there's nothing else in the Bible you don't have 
music ministers and directors that are springing up everywhere. You don't have all sorts of other functionaries and additions. You have preaching and you have prayer. So that was my second heading, and you'll find it more as the passage goes on here. The twin foundations of ministry, preaching and prayer. And then I'm going to give a third heading, just working gently through, and that is this. In the scripture, people were blessed by God and appointed by the churches who were proved men. They were proved in their work and in their ministry. That's less and less the case today. So here you find people who are proved being appointed we call them deacons. They aren't called deacons strictly here, not until later on in the New Testament. The saying pleased the whole multitude, verse 5, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip. Stephen and Philip are mentioned first because they're going to be mentioned further in this chapter and in the following chapter. And then others are mentioned. Interestingly, they all have Greek names. And that leads a great many people to conclude that the church went overboard as far as it possibly could to solve the problem that the Greek-speaking widows were neglected by appointing all Greek-speaking uh, deacons or ornaments to look after the people. You can't really conclude that because a lot of Hebrews by this time were bearing Greek names also. So you can't absolutely conclude that they were members of the Greek speaking Jewish community but they set them before the apostles verse 6 and when they had prayed not a formal prayer not a brief formal prayer but they really prayed for them prayer was always sincere in New Testament times and they laid their hands on them not necessarily to impart any power well, it's a symbolic matter here I believe they laid their hands on them in a solemn commissioning and verse 7 the word of God increased it already has done, but it's increasing further. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. If you start with 20 to 25,000 at least, whatever is it growing to? And an even more wonderful thing at the end of verse 7, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The priests, or a very large number of them, seemed to be converted Late in the day, they were the most resistant, the most stubborn. Of course, in a way, they had the most to lose. Priests converted. They're going to lose their position and their whole standing in society and their function. But they were obedient to the faith. They believed in Christ, that the old order had passed and the new had come. But verse 8, and Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. I can't tell you how many weeks or months have passed, maybe almost at once, but this is my heading, people who are proved are advanced in the New Testament ministry. Stephen, he's just been appointed one of those to supervise or work out the ministry of the distribution of help, compassionate help. But now you find him functioning differently, almost at once. But how many months had passed, or time? And then it became clear that Stephen was to be more than only a supervisor of compassionate things. Stephen, full of faith, and power, that is, power to do amazing things, did great wonders and miracles. Well, that's the province of apostles. And previously, we've read that the apostles alone worked these miracles. But now there's a non-apostle who is given the power to heal and to do great things. 
and he's clearly been absorbed, though he's not an apostle, into the apostolic band as an assistant because only the apostles and the group of apostles had these powers but by the people he's identified with them and the powers extend to him they would also to Philip but those are the only two non-apostles in the New Testament who are definitely given the power to work miracles there were no others Yes, Ananias worked one. Barnabas, assistant to Paul, for a period of time, may have, but it's not conclusive. It may, he may have, but you can't really say. Only Stephen and Philip, definitely, outside the apostolic band, were given a similar power. Some say... The apostles laid hands on these two assistants and gave them the power. Well, that may be. Stephen, full of faith and power. Did he preach? Well, of course he did. You see it in verse 10. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So, here you have a person who is advanced, if that's the right word, to the preaching ministry because he was clearly proven. He begins as a deacon, as it were, organizing and distributing compassionate aid, but in no time you find he, as Philip in due course, is acting as an assistant to the apostles, if we may put it that way. So in the New Testament, proven men are blessed. I just wanted to make that heading and I'll pass on now to another heading in verse 9. Opposition follows instrumentality. Then there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and may be in the same group, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, what is implied is there were at least three synagogues here. Synagogues we can read congregations. They didn't necessarily have at this stage their own buildings, but these are Jewish people who are going to oppose the gospel and particularly persecute Stephen. So Stephen is really effective in reaching people. Why is it that the opposition now is going to come from the Greek-speaking Jewish community. Why are they going to be the ones? Well, Stephen is obviously ministering to them. He is clearly a Greek speaker. He's making a tremendous impression upon the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews. And so the next big phase of persecution will be touched off by them and the Hebrew unconverted will join in. So there, verse 9, you have these other language groups and they dispute with Stephen and they were not able to resist, verse 10, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He was earnest, he was fervent, he was so wise in the marshalling of his arguments and his persuasions in applying the gospel and many were converted no doubt but those that were not hated it and they brought about the next persecution verse 11 they suborned men which means that they engaged people who would lie for them and bring about miscarriage of justice then they suborned men which said we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Was it true? Well, no, of course it wasn't true. But it was based on truth, and it, it gives us an insight into what Stephen was preaching. Blasphemous words against Moses. They've obviously twisted what he was saying. He would never say hostile words against Moses. But it shows us that what he was preaching was that the 
teaching of Moses was now fulfilled, that the great prophet of which Moses spoke had now come in Jesus Christ, that the ceremonial law which God had given to Moses, which he'd laid down all the ceremonial worship, that it was now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So it was abrogated, it had come to an end. The teaching of Moses wasn't wrong, Stephen was saying. It was glorious, but it was prophetic entirely. And all the worship was types and shadows. And it's now been fulfilled. And the great sacrifice has been made. And Christ has suffered and died on Calvary to make an atonement for sinners, Jews and Gentiles alike, who receive him. So Moses is now surpassed by the one he prophesied, by Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And they twisted that into making out that Stephen was saying, Moses is wrong, Moses is finished, Moses should be abolished and abandoned. We are against the whole ceremonial order and the temple and the teaching of Moses. But that was just a dishonest twisting of what he was saying to blunten the edge of it so that the people wouldn't be impressed and to do away with Stephen. So we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. That doesn't mean they were accusing Stephen of speaking against God, but by speaking against Moses, in their view, he was speaking against God. And these Greek-speaking Jews, agitating, stirred up the people, verse 12, and the elders and the scribes, and came upon him, Stephen that is, and caught him and brought him to the council. So the great Sanhedrin council is set up once again, its meeting in its great chamber in the temple. They have formed how many of them? Well, there were 71 members, but at least 50 plus might have been present. And they were seated in a great semicircle, looking so severe and threatening, just as the apostles had been brought before them. And Stephen would be standing alone in the center of that semicircle. And false witnesses were set up against him. 13, verse 13, a little more detail. This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Well, it's lies, but it reflects what Stephen had been saying. A temple order has come to an end. The ceremonial law is fulfilled. The prophecy, the greatest prophecy of Moses has come to pass. The, the, the Messiah has come. Verse 14, we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. It reflects what Stephen has been saying, but it's cruelly twisted. Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. You wonder if Stephen had been preaching from texts in the book of the prophet Daniel and had warned them that the time will come when God will end the temple order. Or you wonder if they've just brought back again the same charge that was previously made against Christ. But anyway, it's dishonest, but persecution has come and Stephen is at the heart of it. And this brings me really to a last heading and it's this. That now warning is joined to grace in the preaching of the gospel. Or put another way, there must be preaching to bring about conviction of sin. Look at this final verse in the chapter. I'm not going into chapter 7, but look at the final verse in chapter 6. 
and all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on Stephen, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Dear friends, what's going on? They're looking steadfastly on him. Their old-fashioned words kind of deflect our grasp of this. They're staring at him. Their gaze is transfixed. They cannot take their eyes off him. Those severe men, most of them pompous men, self-righteous men, highly antagonistic to the preaching of the gospel and to Stephen. And yet, there's something about him. They cannot stop staring at him. They want to avert their gaze, but they can't. What compels them to stare at Stephen? They saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Oh, you say, that just means he was so composed. He was so benign. He was so kindly, so unafraid, so feeling for them, and it surprised them. Oh no, he may have been all those things. They saw, as it were, the face of an angel. They saw a striking authority there. They'd never seen an angel. They'd only read in the scriptures when God sent an angel or the angel of the Lord. And always there would be true words, authoritative words, striking words, words that had to be listened to. Now Stephen, though I'm not going into it this morning, was to make a defence before them. It would not be a defence at all. It would be a sermon. And it would be a sermon which hardly defended him. It infuriated them. And it brought upon him even more trouble. In fact, what Stephen preached to them, and we'll look at it in chapter 7 another time, is the longest sermon in the book of Acts. And if the record reflects what was literally said, it was twice as long as Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And yet this wasn't to the crowd. This was to hostile judges, the Sanhedrin council. How did they listen to him for so long? How did he sustain their attention when they must have hated every word he said as he unfolded the history of the Jews and their rejection of God? They were infuriated, not just at the end, but increasingly all the way through. How did he ever manage to engage the attention of those hostile people? And they not say, silence the man, enough of this. You have so long to make a defense, but we're not listening to your sermons. Because he had, as it were, the face of an angel. No more information than that. Nothing for the preacher to amplify or to work on, except to say there was a divine authority about them and they couldn't stop him and they couldn't interrupt and they couldn't but listen to every word. And although there's much grace in the sermon, it is overall a sermon of condemnation. It's a sermon that would convict all but the very hardest heart. It's their, may I put it in this language, it's their last chance sermon. Sounds to me. It's the warning sermon. There's been all the preaching. There has been the grace. There has been the miracles, the wonders, which were unanswerable and invincible and the hardest hearts even among the priests many of them have been saved converted and now the Sanhedrin council and it's their last opportunity to repent it's a sermon of warning it's remarkable it's amazing it's astonishing 
I look at it another time. But dear friends, this was my last heading. Blessing always results in persecution. And the very last heading, and that is this, that there must be warning in preaching. Preaching must seek to bring people to repentance. There is grace, but there is warning too. And today, isn't it a tragedy? There are Bible believers who want to get rid of repentance. And they'll tell their students, don't preach about sin. Don't preach about sin. Yet here it is. These are my five headings, just to remind you. In this chapter, chapter 6, the basic principle of church government taught by Christ is honoured and put into effect. The twin foundations and the only two foundations of ministry, proclamation and reliance on the Holy Spirit through prayer. Not all the accretions and the additions of today. The third heading was proven men are appointed. So you see, Philip and Stephen, in due course we'll hear about him, they proved in one office and then they receive another. And then we saw, fourthly, opposition follows faithful ministry. It can't be avoided. And then finally, there must be a warning element preaching for the conviction of sin. And then we have the privilege of coming to this longest sermon in the book of Acts. Dear friends, just some headings which I believe reflect the expansion of the church in the book of Acts, chapter 6.